After these two days of discussion, sometimes passionate, uh, I think we, are, we all agree on the fact that it's urgent to take action to uh, reach the objectives in terms of uh, avoiding the negative impact of climate change. And uh, so we are all aware of this necessity, but we are also all aware of difficulties. Uh, difficulty to predict, which was mentioned before, is one of these difficulties. Probably also the difficulty to, to change the organizations, you know, uh, and to, to move to another type of uh, framework and with new technologies, with new organization and new systems and so on. It's probably one of these difficulties, but definitely there is one necessity, which is to adapt a, a proper regulation that would be conducive to uh, these objectives that we are all agreeing upon and particularly it's uh, it's an issue at each national level because there are national specificities but indeed uh, we it's also a regional issue and that's why it's good to have a european approach to this uh, regulatory matters so this will be discussed this morning well uh, i will briefly uh, present uh, each of you uh, andreas pulikas who is the chairman of cyprus energy regulatory authority uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Sotirios uh, Manoklidis, Vice Chairman, Regulatory Authority for Energy uh, RI, RA. Arthur Richier, Senior Pricing Specialist, Tanker Markets, S&P Global Platz. Dimitrios uh, Palperis, GE, Power Services, Managing Director, Balkans and West Caspian. And Gianfranco Scalabrini, a well-known person at ESCP Europe. Uh, who is the um, a partner for 3H Partners and professor in the energy markets, cooperating, as I said, heavily with us. So thank you for that. Uh, and uh, Michael Mikkelsen, Europe Head of Energy Research and Innovation, UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office and UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial <laughs> Strategy. <laughs> okay, so... Considering the time we have, I think if you can limit your speech to 10 minutes maximum, eight minutes would be welcome indeed, so that we can have a bit of time for the discussion. So let's start uh, the first on the list. Andreas uh, Pulikas, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the introduction. Also, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, well, uh, here is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first, uh, I will present you the European Union long-term energy strategy uh, towards future sustainable energy systems. Uh, then, in order to stimulate the discussion later on, I will present you, uh, I will concentrate actually on the Southeast Mediterranean region and how the Southeast Mediterranean region can be an energy exported to the European Union in long term uh, based on the concept of the hydrogen economy. And I will then close this presentation with the next step that we are required, the Southeast Mediterranean uh, countries, in order to achieve this uh, goal. Now, here, just uh, uh, to remind you that we are all familiar with the 2020 package, uh, uh, which asks for 20% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, a 20% uh, use of the renewable energy sources, and also 20% increase in the energy efficiency. Now, the uh, 2030 package, the so-called Energy Union package, calls for a 40% reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions, 32% uh, uh, use of renewable energy sources, and more than 32% uh, increase in the uh, energy efficiency. Of course, the long-term target is the reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 by 80%. And in this slide here, I show you the outcome. By 2050, we expect a reduction of 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and in particular, the uh, power sector will have zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Therefore, we need to develop the technologies in order to achieve this goal. I will show you in three slices the current energy system of the European Union and how this can be converted, can be transformed into a more sustainable one 
towards the hydrogen economy. In this slide, I show you the current energy system, which, of course, the uh, black line concerns the uh, oil, which is used in all sectors of the economy, industrial sector, uh, uh, domestic sector, uh, uh, transport sector, and also in some cases for power generation. Now, with green line concerns the natural gas. Again, natural gas, it is used widely in all uh, sectors of the economy, and also for power generation in European Union countries. We have a nuclear, coal, and natural gas. Now, in an optimistic scenario, how to transform the European Union energy system into a more sustainable one towards the hydrogen economy, uh, between 2020 and 2030, uh, the uh, oil can be used only for the transport sector. Natural gas will continue to be used in all sectors of the economy, and also part of the natural gas can be reformed and then producing hydrogen, and then hydrogen can be used for power generation. It will have the appearance of the first hydrogen power generation plants. Also, uh, we'll have the appearance of the hydrogen communities, communities self-sustain in power generation using renewables, and the excess electricity produced can be used in order to produce hydrogen, and then hydrogen to be uh, used in the regional hydrogen distribution networks. And finally, with this optimistic scenario, between 2040 and 2050, we will have the full transformation of the European Union system, moving from the uh, hydrocarbon economy to uh, hydrogen economy. Uh, oil disappears from the scene. Uh, hydrogen is used in all sectors of the economy, and also uh, natural gas will be used in the industrial sector. Now, concerning the uh, future power systems, today, as we all know, the power is produced centrally in the power stations and then transmitted through the transmission and distribution networks to the uh, consumers. Now, the future power system is more complicated, uh, is a smart system, of course, and the innovation in this system, in this future power system, are those red rectangles, which concerns storage. And in our case, since we are uh, discussing about hydrogen economy, this means storage of hydrogen. And this will allow more integration of renewable energy systems into uh, power systems. Uh, and for example, during the night when there is wind, in some cases we cannot commit the wind parts due to the technical problems that might create in the system. With this configuration, when there is uh, wind potential available, the wind parks will uh, operate, will produce electricity, the electricity will then be transformed into hydrogen, hydrogen can be stored and then can be used during the day in order to meet the peak demand or uh, in the transport sector. Now, let me concentrate on the Southeast Mediterranean region now. And first, let me show you the indigenous energy sources in these uh, countries. For example, in the Southeast Mediterranean region, we have proven gas reserves and also potential gas reserves in the Israeli exclusive economic zone, in Cyprus, EZ, in Egypt, as well as in Greece. Second indigenous um, uh, source is the wind potential, uh, in which in the Aegean Sea we have high wind potential, as well as, as, well as in some areas uh, within Egypt. And the final indigenous energy source is solar potential, in which we can observe that in Crete, Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt, we have high solar potential. How we can use these indigenous energy sources to move towards the hydrogen economy? With these energy sources, we can actually produce hydrogen, either through natural gas reforming or using renewable energy sources in order to produce green hydrogen. I think I have 53 seconds. Is that correct? So let me move a little bit. Uh, this is uh, my final uh, slide. 
Uh, so, how now the Southeast Mediterranean region countries can be an energy exporter to the European Union. Here I show you the future, the installation of the so-called super smart grid, uh, which we expect this after 2050, of course. We observe that, oh, sorry. We observe that we have here interconnections, electric interconnections between Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, and then through Crete to the uh, internal uh, electricity market of the European Union. And by this configuration, uh, renewable energy sources will be installed where the potential is high. For example, wind potential is high on the south, on the west coast of uh, Europe, as well as in the west coast of uh, uh, North Africa, and also, as I mentioned before, in the Aegean Sea and also in some parts in Egypt. Now, concerning the solar um, power systems, those can be installed in the North Africa as well as in the Middle East, and also photovoltaics can be used, uh, can be utilized in uh, south of Europe. And also, other renewable energy sources, such as hy uh, hydropower, these can be stored where the potential is available, Bio biomass the same, as well as marine and geothermal technologies where the potential is high. And of course, in order to complete the scene, we need storage. And talking about uh, hydrogen economy, storage will be in the form of hydrogen. So let me close with this slide, this presentation, uh, with uh, the uh, plan that it is required from the Southeast Mediterranean countries in order to become energy exporters, and in this case, hydrogen exporters or electricity exporters. So we need to develop a strategic plan with electrical interconnections to integrate sustainable technologies, uh, um, uh, possible pipeline interconnections or virtual pi pipelines, and use of hydrogen after 2030, and the hydrogen can be produced either from renewables or from natural gas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very clear, straight to the point, and it was a perfect timing presentation. So may I call now the next speaker, uh, Mr. Sotiros uh, Manoukidis. The floor is yours. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, distinguished colleagues and friends, speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I would uh, uh, move on the demand side of uh, energy and energy, uh, especially electricity in the southeastern European region. And thus, without having anticipated, it is a complimentary uh, presentation to uh, the uh, excellent paper we uh, just heard that uh, my colleague, president of uh, the Cyprus Regulatory Authority of Energy, Dr. Polikas, delivered. Demand and response. Energy management means to optimize one of the most complex and important technical creations that we know, the energy system, it was clearly portrayed to you before. While there is plenty of experience in optimizing energy generation, and we have future plans, as you already heard, uh, uh, with targets for the year um, 2030 and 2050, uh, it is the demand side that receives increasing attention by research and industry. Demand side management is a portfolio that measures to improve the energy system at the side of consumption. The smart grid is conceived as an electric grid that can deliver electricity in a controlled, smart way from points of generation to active consumers. Demand response by promoting the interaction and responsiveness of customers may offer a broad range of potential benefits on system operation and expansion and, at the end, on market efficiency. 
Moreover, by improving the reliability of the power system and in the long term, lowering peak demand, demand response reduces overall plant and capital costs investments. It is thus the electric power industry that considers demand response program as an increasingly valuable resource and it leads to great modernization. <coughs> Energy consumers need some incentive to respond to such a request from a demand response provider. Those incentives can be either tariff-based incentives, uh, which in the short term might even include mandatory cutbacks at peak hours of demand, and uh, usually it will include a policy based on a rebate or other incentive base of uh, firm commitments to reduce power during periods of high demand, sometimes referred to, and this is a new terms uh, in, in the economics of uh, uh, energy, megawatts. Commercial and industrial power users might impose load shedding on themselves without a request from a producing utility. Unfortunately, this is a vision for the future. Currently in the region, and in particular in Greece, which in that sense is, is, is a, uh, one of the developed uh, countries uh, in uh, electricity uh, demand and response alongside with uh, Bulgaria, uh, we are talking about only 1%. Uh, so I would not go into the details how uh, 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 demand and response will be increased by uh, network efficiency. It was clearly pointed out to you uh, by the previous speaker. Uh, so uh, we will move to a comparative example to show you how clearly uh, how the demand response is developing uh, in a mature market, which is the United States. Commercial and industrial customers make up a small share of the number of demand response customers, 7% and less than 1% respectively, but they provide larger shares of energy savings and receive much larger incentives. So uh, if we look at the US market, the average annual commercial customer incentive is almost 600 US dollars by using the demand response uh, available choices and in particular smart grids. The average annual commercial customer incentive would go up to 9,000 US dollars. I would give you, being a lawyer, uh, a court case uh, back from the year 2016 where the United States Supreme Court ruled in the case of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission against the Electricity Power Supply Association. In a wholesale market grid, Administrator accept bids from electricity generators to continuously match supply with demand. Bids are ordered from the lowest to the highest and they are accepted until the supply sufficiency meets demand. The court's decision focused on those orders by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, which stated that demand response providers could be compensated based on the locational marginal price as if they were power generators themselves. A lower court did not accept that reasoning, vacated the orders, providing uh, a different model, a separation between power traders and power generation. 
The ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court provides an assurance that demand response will continue to play an active role in wholesale electricity markets. The ruling may increase the market for demand response in the, real, in the near term, especially as more advanced electric meters and appliances and equipment than can be cycled by grid operators continue to be adopted across uh, the U.S. grid. The most forward, uh, most advanced uh, state is obviously California. What is a vision to the future? A vision, a vision to the future is market liberalization as wholesale price caps will be removed in the area uh, in, in southeastern Europe. Uh, you would have a real value of electricity in time and location, a scarcity price to drive investments towards the flexible assets most needed in the system. Uh, another option will, uh, alongside is sustainability. Uh, you already uh, heard about the vision of the hydrogen uh, energy economy by the year uh, 2050, and obviously uh, an imperative, otherwise all uh, such discussion uh, becomes fruitless, is security of supply, electricity and gas transmission grids should be reviewed from a regional perspective in order to increase competition in the energy internal market and provide system stability. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Well, so the next speaker is now Mr. Arthur Richer. And thank you for the perfect timing again. Dear members and most welcome guests, my name is Arthur and I'm a pricing specialist at Platts, meaning I price the cost of commodities as well as their transport. As a former student of uh, Costas, it's uh, great to be here. Now today I'm going to stay within the regulation framework, but I'm going to do this in the context of an industry that's very dear to my heart and that has always been at the heart of the Greek economy, that is the shipping industry. First of all, let me introduce you to the IMO. The International Maritime Organization is a specialized branch of the UN, and they're in charge of regulating the shipping industry. Now, on October 28, 2016, they voted a new law, a law which would lower the current sulfur limit within bunker fuels used for ships from 3.5% to 0.5%. This will come into effect on January 1st, 2020, hence the name IMO 2020. And it is the impact of this regulation within the context of the European energy transition that I will present to you today. These two graphs will help to illustrate my point. Now, the major impact will be an increase in the cost of transporting certain commodities, specifically crude and other petroleum products, as well as the cost of these products in themselves. On the graph to the left, you can see different vessel sizes on different routes. Now, in a scenario where the price between the current sulfur fuel, known as high sulfur fuel, or HSFO, and the new 0.5%, if the spread between those two reaches $400 a ton, you can see that the price of transporting a barrel of crude will increase by 3% out of West Africa. Platts last assessed the Nigerian crude, known as Bonnie Light, at $73. Hence, an increase in $3 for that crude represents about a 4% increase right off the bat following that regulation. On the right, you can see the spike in flat rates of transportation uh, in 2020, purely based on that regulation. Now, this is going to impact a multitude of other sectors. As we can see, it's going to impact petrochemicals, metals, shipping, as well as retail energy prices. Now, petrochemicals, and especially refineries, are going to have to adapt to that new demand in low sulfur fuel. And this is going to impact other um, outputs of these refineries the chairs you're currently sitting on, the tags you're currently wearing around your necks, all this comes out of uh, refineries and is made with petrochemicals. And there'll be an increase in price there. For metals, it'll be a higher price for aluminum manufacturing, and we can imagine that it's gonna impact a multitude of sectors such as the automotive industry. 
in shipping, a higher freight cost is obviously the, the main one. Now, it is cheaper to fish a salmon in Scotland, send it all the way to China, get it filleted there, and then send it back to Scotland, purely based on the cost of labor, and as well based on the economies of scale thanks to shipping. This may change in the near future. There'll be a shift in trade routes as well, with the cost of transporting coal, for example, becoming uh, more important. Some countries might move uh, the places from which they buy coal from maybe South Africa to, to Indonesia. And where consumers will feel the, the grunt of this change will be in retail prices. Now, we expect, assuming that Brent will grow up $7 a barrel based on this regulation, that the crack between diesel and Brent will increase by close to $20. Now, the crack is simply the spread in price between two petroleum products. As we have seen with the infamous uh, Gilets Jaunes movement in France, there was a massive impact um, on a potential increase of the price of diesel and the political upheaval that followed. So one can only imagine um, what that might do in the near future if governments are not uh, prepared for this increase in retail energy prices. Now, so where lies the, the silver lining uh, with this transition? The silver lining here is an incredible opportunity for the shipping industry to move towards a cleaner alternative. And that alternative fuel is LNG. As you can see from this graph, there's approximately 150 ships across all uh, sectors of shipping currently using LNG. If you look at the LNG ships on order, it's close to 150, or nearly a 100% increase. So ship owners are really taking the opportunity to move towards a cleaner alternative in terms of the fuel for their ships. So just a quick recap. IMO 2020 is happening whether we want it or not that's going to lead to an increase in the price of transporting goods. That is going to have a knock-on effect on the price of these goods, whether it's commodities or the end products that you use in, in everyday life. And the way this fits into the, the European energy transition, LNG and the development of LNG infrastructure has been identified as a key goal um, to help with the transition towards less emissions and a cleaner future. And the shipping industry is well positioned to be at the forefront of this change following this regulation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Then I'm calling the, the next speaker, uh, Mr. Dimitrios uh, Paperis. Thank you. If, yes, if you can help. Yeah. So, um, I'm honored to be here today. Thank, I would like to thank Costas for um, this kind invitation. Um, this is this Salazi? Parpaires. Okay. So, so I'm going to just present it verbally. I think they have, don't have my presentation. Mix up. Ah, okay. Can you maybe let's uh, make a shift, okay, and I'll present next. Can you maybe we can maybe we can shift if the next speaker can intervene now, Franco? I think it's. Uh, could you could you talk now? Maybe maybe we could have Franco Scalabrini before, and then they have time to. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. If they have money. Okay. Yes. Let's let's, let's see. Do you have it ready or no? No. No. So if you, well, if they don't yeah, have that, just uh, go on, go on. Okay. It's in. They don't have the. The uh, Okay. So I'll just present it verbally. I'm working for General Electric. I'm the managing director of uh, for power services in G for the cluster of uh, the Balkans and West Caspian. The cluster consists of um, Greece and Cyprus also. So I'm responsible to to generate for our shareholders around $100 million per year in revenue in an ethical, um, safe, and compliant business practice. So what we do in GE, we are a technology provider. 
and we are, you know, we have a huge installed fleet of um, machines in all spectrum, or from renewable up to nuclear. Um, I'm following the gas business, the, the gas power plants, the combined cycle power plants, and um, the market is changing, and G is changing also. We are in, within a restructuring period these days, and we are in optimizing our operations, we are optimizing our business models, and we are becoming more flexible uh, as expected from our clients, because this is what matters. Um, so the European, let's say, market has changed the last decade a lot. Uh, what we see today is a, a, a structural change uh, and an installed base transformation. Uh, we see a lot of uh, renewable energy sources being added. Uh, we see nuclear phase out in some countries. We see lignite and coal, you know, decline in production. And we, haven't, we don't see any large scale storage for the next five years. So the gas turbines and the gas market has a key role to play on that because we see ourselves as the equilibrium force. Um, we have also some segment dynamics. You know, we have, uh, there's a lot of coal to gas switching these days, uh, driven by high CO2 prices and um, global gas price dynamics, very volatile, and also LNG surplus. And uh, this is evident most in countries like Germany and France and Spain and Italy, but it's also now pretty evident in Greece also locally. And we see also nuclear power production, you know, uh, we have a lot of forced and unplanned outages this year in France and Belgium, which means we needed a lot of power coming from the gas uh, power plants, and this exploded the prices. Um, and the outcome between this structural change and the segment dynamics is, you know, there is a, an increased need for gas in Europe, and we see gas recovering. And, um, and the dynamics make, like, for the operators, for our clients, you know, the market is less predictable for them, so they have to be very flexible, very dynamic, uh, and be able to, you know, to adapt to, to faster to the changes that are coming. In terms of uh, the last decade, what we have seen in, uh, in, the, in the market in Europe is, you know, uh, operators, you know, are, were used to operate the assets on, on base load, uh, and uh, output and base load efficiency, what's happening these days, we, have, uh, we need efficiency across the whole range of the operation of the plant. We need availability and flexibility. And uh, this is what GE is doing these days. And uh, the, our chief innovation officer was here yesterday and presented about what GE is doing on the, on the digital side, on the innovation side. So what, what we're trying to do is to support our clients, you know, to digitize their operation, upgrade the units, make them more flexible and more reliable. And on, on, based on that, we are continuously introducing new products in the market, either, has, either digital products or, or products like new gas turbines, H-class units, using additive manufacturing, using new processes. So we are ready, we are listening to the market, we are adapting to the market, and we are supporting our clients to produce power in an efficient, reliable way. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. So, uh, next one is Franco Scalabrini. That's your turn. Thank you all for the timing, which is perfect. So, thank you very much. Now I try to bring you from the biggest system to the something of more rudimental, but uh, not for these uh, simpler to be managed. How are cities and uh, the uh, services correlated to? In particular, <clears throat> I start doing this from two facts. First one, the marginality of the pure commodities in all the sectors is progressively decreasing. I can say squeezing. It is real if we look at energy the same if we look at uh, telecom uh, services. So, as we said last year, more or less all the multi-utilities, all the players, are migrating from the pure commodity to the value-added services. 
Value-added services are a way for them to make our life and our businesses simpler and uh, more li leaner, more lean. Until here, everything is uh, simple. In particular, there is a challenge that we have to, to face, that is the credibility. Why the credibility is a challenge? Because the connectivity is the, the base, is the enabler for all these value-added added services. But no one of these players is fully credible all, all over the service, all over the end-to-end -end chain. In particular, a telecom company is very credible in connectivity, but not in the content. An energy company, an energy player, is very credible in energy monitoring, but not in the, supply, in the uh, devices management. A device vertical uh, operator is credible in these, but not in connectivity, and so on. So I can uh, uh, read your, your uh, thoughts to say, OK, simple. We can coordinate them and put them all together. Unfortunately, it is not so simple. Why it is not so simple? Because many of these players are competitors between them, and they offer more or less the same services. If we look around in the world from, uh, um, I don't know, Centrica uh, in UK, NL in Italy, Endesa in Spain, uh, EDF in France, more or less, telco, energy providers, device producers, and uh, other types of players as bank or um, fiber provider and so on offer more or less the same, the same services. All these trends are accentuated if we look at uh, the cities, at the city level, at the, in the smart cities. Why? The smart cities are booming. Booming for three key reasons. First one, because of demographic. The 70% of uh, uh, the global population in more or less 30, 40 years uh, will live concentrated in the cities. So there is a demographic concentration. Second one, scarcity of resources. S the, the application of value-added services to the cities is a way to maximize the efficiency and the effectiveness of scarce resources as water, power, uh, transport and so on. Last but not least, technology. We have a technological evolution that allow us something that only 10 years ago was completely un unpredictable and unthinkable. Uh, One example of this could be the smart pole. What is the smart pole? The smart pole is the public lighting pole that integrates all the services around, from the 5G to the high-definition uh, uh, video cameras, to the uh, environmental sensors, uh, to the um, electrical uh, uh, power recharge, and so on. It is the solution of uh, uh, many problems, in particular because of the capillarity. Let's, let's think how cap <coughs> Sorry, capillar uh, poles are one every five to ten uh, meters in the uh, center of the cities. <laughs> Which are the players that could be interested in, uh, in this? For sure, telecom company. Why? Because of 5G and uh, Wi-Fi coverage. For sure, uh, automotive players and uh, um, power utilities because of integrated station for electrical vehicles. Could be the local uh, municipalities because of real-time env environmental uh, data monitoring. Could be the public security authorities because of advanced safety. Could be the uh, mobility uh, authority because of real-time traffic monitoring could be the um, multi-utility for the smart lights, could be the grid, 
because of backup battery done by the appliances connected to the, the poles, and so on. Let's imagine, for example, the um, uh, targeted advertising that you can do knowing how many people of a specific segment are passing in a specific area in a specific moment. So there are a lot of applications. But we have to find a way to transform these conflicts in synergies. Why? Because traffic monitoring could be interesting to forecast in mobility utilization. Because fiber could be the enabler for the 5G aerials. Uh, pedestrian data could be the basis uh, for the dynamic advertising. So we need one specific word, that is coordination. But who is the deputy um, entity to perform this coordination? For example, come back for one second to the uh, light poles, no, for, for the smart poles. Let's think about two, three possible uh, business models for it. We have one first business model, that is local municipalities replace the traditional poles and are the only beneficiaries managing the services for citizens and maybe selling available data to provide companies. Which are the pros? One, local municipalities have direct uh, control over data. Second, municipalities have an additional revenue stream in case of data sold to private companies. They sell data and they make money. Cons, municipalities have to manage uh, the complexity of the transition from uh, traditional to smart poles, and typically they are not so able to manage the, the complexity. Second, typically they are not able to sustain the replacement investment. They have not so many money, in particular in some countries as like Italy or Greece uh, and so on. Second, oh, exactly, or France. Second, Poll replacement is managed by third-party players who provide value-added services, Part, for example, Cisco system. Uh, part of the energy saving is reverted to municipality and part is used to repay the investment. Pros, municipalities don't have to invest in technology and to manage the transition towards mass, uh, smart poles. Minus, cons, low margin if the third party is a pure intermediary. Uh, municipalities don't, feel don't, don't uh, uh, fully benefit from uh, uh, energy saving and the potential conflict with the local communities. Third, project financing. We put in place a project fin financing for the substitution. Here we have the, con the pros, uh, the absence of intermediaries, okay, uh, allows smart poles um, provider to act as a unique reference. Cons is that municipalities don't fully benefit from energy saving and potential conflict with local communities communities are still alive. So I close with uh, some questions that obviously I cannot answer now, but that we should have in mind if we want to evolve in this big integration of services passing from the pure commodity to the value added services. First one is, who are the best coordinator for all these value added services, in particular in the smart cities? Second. How can the cities ben, ben, uh, be segmented in terms of services and business model? So who, no, what can we offer to who? Third, how the politics could be involved in this game? We have to involve the municipalities, yes or no? We have to involve the state uh, uh, regulator, yes or no? Fourth, is the public opinion ready or it needs educational, because we are experts, we are sector, uh, sector operators for us. These things are quite uh, um, common, quite, we are confident to them. But if I speak with my mom about uh, uh, smart uh, poles or smart cities, she said, no, no, I prefer to pay my supermarket uh, by cash. Thank you very much. So now last but not least indeed, Michael uh, Michelson.
Yes, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Hellenic uh, Association for uh, Energy Economics for having me here. Um, I always love coming here to Greece. I come here every year because uh, my wife is Greek, so this is the first time I'm here for work, so I'm very excited. Um, so the UK is currently underseeing a, a significant transformation in its energy system, which is uh, resulting in a paradigm shift in the way that we produce, uh, transport, distribute, and uh, consume energy. And it's having uh, a significant implication for regulation and new market designs. And we, I'm going to be giving you a bit of an overview of where the transition has been, uh, how it's been playing out, where it's going, and um, some of the challenges that uh, lie ahead in both pitfalls and promises. So. Um, the, the real backbone uh, behind the UK energy transition is the, uh, the Climate Change Act of 2008, which has two core components. It uh, firstly requires the government to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 80% uh, compared to 1990 levels by 2050. And secondly, it establishes the Committee on Climate Change that ensures that emission targets are evidence-based, independently assessed, as well as to um, provide advice on the role of different low-carbon innovations to help meeting decarbonizations of individual sectors. Now, the, in terms of the, the target of uh, the 2050 is now being uh, reconsidered in context of the 1.5 degree report from the IPCC. Now, um, since the 1990, the UK has seen its carbon emissions reduce 42%, so we're nearly half, half the way at the same time growing the economy by three quarters. Um, this means that the UK is now leading the G7 uh, countries in carbon emission reductions, at the same time as we are also de decoupling uh, CO2 emissions from economic growth uh, fastest among the G20. In the last 10 years, this decarbonization has been largely played out in the power sector, or by three quarters. And this has manifested itself as a huge drop in the share of fossil fuels in the um, electricity mix from 80, about 80% 80 down to less than half, with the, the biggest uh, the f uh, decline being seen in the use of coal from uh, about third to less than 7% now. Uh, with more marginal decreases in the, in the gas sector. We've also seen a decline in energy consumption by 16%, at the same time as households have grown by, one, uh, by, uh, by 5%, so this is equivalent of two and a half uh, nuclear power plants gener uh, output. And um, in parallel, we've seen low carbon sources contributing to more than half, with uh, more than uh, about, uh, about a third of it being uh, renewables. Now, uh, one of the better known success stories is the, the offshore wind sector in the UK. We've got uh, seven gigawatts already of capacity installed with another seven gigawatts uh, in the pipeline. Now, we've seen uh, the auction price for offshore wind uh, being nearly halved in only a few years. This means that the price of offshore wind is now cheaper than gas and certainly cheaper than nuclear. And in the back of this, the UK um, government has basically signed an offshore wind sector deal, which commits the government of procuring additional two uh, gigawatts per year uh, up to 2030, which will see us um, anticipating about 30% of electricity production coming from offshore wind alone. And there are some exciting uh, developments that can even further the, the progress of the offshore wind, which has to do with uh, floating uh, floating offshore, which gives us uh, the ability to in, uh, harness greater resources further afield from shore, um, with uh, the world's uh, two uh, first um, offshore floating wind parks um, being now um, underway in the UK. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the other the contributions of other renewable energy generation, but I would like to mention uh, perhaps a lesser known success, success story, which has to do with uh, the use of biomethane deployment. Since 2012, we've seen about 98 anaerobic digestion uh, plants that are injecting biomethane into the grid. We anticipate the production being around 2.5 terawatt hours this year. Uh, and this has only happened in the last few years, and we anticipate that this can actually, uh, this use utilizes anaerobic digestion uh, with feedstock from uh, agricultural and food waste, which we anticipate uh, being able to meet up to 5 to 10 percent of our heating requirements. Um, we've also seen some significant growths in the solar uh, PV sector. It's now uh, underway designing new feed-in tariffs, um, which will enable households to actually sell excess, uh, s s well, basically surplus energy generation onto the grid. And we already have a couple of companies that have uh, taken uh, spearheading role in this uh, Octopus Energy and uh, EDF. 
Now, the impact in terms of uh, the transition on the, uh, the economy is that we now see the low carbon economy growing uh, in 2017 was 6.8%, uh, which is nearly fourfold the growth of the rest of the economy. We also see the number of employees being, um, who are working in the sector around 209,000. That means that there are about 30,000 more people working on disrupting the sector as opposed to the people who are working in the traditional sector of uh, 181,000. And uh, a few years ago, the UK um, government uh, inaugurated the clean growth strategy, which is a critical pillar of the industrial strategy, which sets out a 2.5 billion investment to support clean energy transition up to 2021. Now, it cuts across many different sectors, but um, as emissions have been falling largely in the power sector, we see now that the, the emissions from transport sector have become the biggest emitter, accounting for approximately 28%. Uh, so um, now there's a strategy which they've set out that uh, commits 1.5 billion in uh, investment in low emission vehicles to 2020 under the Road to Zero strategy. And let me just go through very quickly some of the policy highlights. It entails end the sales of new conventional petrol and diesel cars by 2040. I believe Scotland has put that uh, target even uh, closer at 2032. A uh, quarter of the central government car fleet will be EVs by 2022. Um, 48 million in ultra low emission bus scheme, 900 million pounds uh, for ultra low emission vehicle development and manufacturing, 400 million charging infra infrastructure investment fund, uh, plug in car grants to help consumers in incentivize the uptake of EVs, and the Department of Transport has launched the biggest regulatory review in, in a generation which will outline how it plans to transform the transport industry with green technology, and this includes looking at uh, mobility as a service uh, as one of the exciting areas. Um, also worth mentioning that uh, London has basically electrified the biggest uh, bus fleet in Europe, uh, the Waterloo Garage of 40, uh, 47 buses, and the, London has uh, plans to electrify the remaining, uh, I believe, 70 garages with about 100 um, electrical buses per garage. So how is that for market pool? Now, the problem is that we see now with increasing uh, share of variable and intermittent renewables, uh, it makes it harder and harder to balance um, supply with demand. And when you include the electrification of transport and, and partially to some degree heating, um, just adding one EV can basically be at least adding two households of electricity demand onto the grid. So a lot of the, uh, the work that's going on now is basically looking at how we can actually facilitate flexibility markets we have uh, Centrica that is basically funding 90 million um, pounds uh, local energy uh, system, which basically uh, utilizes blockchain to uh, coordinate and dispatch different flexibility um, assets, both demand side response, storage, and other generators. We've got a blockchain company, uh, Pico, which is working with all six of the uh, di distribution system operators that are now basically procuring about 500 megawatts in 70 different uh, regions across the UK from 160 flex service providers. And uh, the prospering from the energy re revolution is one of the, the key innovation projects uh, that is basically looking at how to increase the number of uh, quality and local energy initiatives with several successful demonstrations, uh, redu um, ensuring cost reductions and emission reductions by sector coupling, by looking at uh, service-based uh, approach, so replace the asset-based and kilowatt-hour-based approach to the energy market, and, and utilizing the, the new smart digital infrastructure, artificial intelligence, and ma ma machine learning to manage distributed assets. So um, this will entail enormous amount of regulatory reform and, um, and, and market restructuring, which uh, I'll be happy to go into further details during our uh, panel discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you all for <clears throat> having complied with the time constraints very well so that we have enough time for discussion. And if you don't mind, I will use the privilege of being the moderator to, to start the discussion. Well, well, I'm an optimistic guy, so I've, it seems that there are solutions, a lot of solutions, and they will be implemented so that I think that the goals I and mean, the objectives will be reached one day. The, the, the question is, well, what about all the resistance? It seems to me that there are a series of resistance, you know, which, which are not so much uh, discussed. I mean, the discussion is a lot about what are the solutions that could solve the problem and so on, but not enough on, okay, yes, but how do we, how do, we do it? And the first resistance I would see is you have a lot of historical players, you know? And for instance, if you, if you take the, the point of uh, demand response, which is part of the solution, obviously, it means that you transfer 
the power from the major players today to the consumers. Will they accept it? I know some situation as a French where I know that some historical players would resist to that because, you know, they, they, are not, they, they can accept the idea that in the long run they will have to give up. And, but, you know, they are not rushing to implement the solution. So uh, that, that would be my first question. What is your view on this? Uh, how do you think we could tackle this problem? How we could make sure that all the players, particularly those who are the influential players today, will be, let's say, playing the game? So I don't know who wants to start answering this. Yeah, please. <coughs> well, uh, this is a very good question. And uh, the uh, a simple answer is that with proper regulation. So we need proper regulation in order actually to encourage demand response. And this is what will happen uh, in the following five or six years. Uh, this is what we actually trying now to implement within the regulatory frameworks within the European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a very uh, crucial issue if we take into consideration that uh, power generation, electricity generation, for as long as it exists, uh, not only the European Union, but globally, is uh, based on uh, a producer side. It was large installations providing electricity to consumers who had very few options. To overturn that, there is a lot of resistance. But as my uh, colleague uh, from Cyprus, uh, Andreas Pulikas, mentioned, uh, we go forward by creating a new regulatory framework. If I may uh, be sort, bring just a, a Greek example, it is appalling that uh, there is a, a pending attempt to introduce smart greeters uh, smart meters uh, at the consumer side for over 12 years. And again, we are now discussing for a new bid to have the sev about 7.5 million uh, household meters being replaced, the very old traditional meters, with smart metering. And it is both the companies that resist that despite the fact that there is, with uh, using traditional meters, uh, a uh, overhead, the, 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 uh, the, they're, they're losing money uh, because of, of that. But there is also a resistance on, uh, as was rightfully pointed out, on the consumer side, who will only benefit, but uh, as uh, the old lady that goes to the supermarket and refuses uh, uh, to uh, use a prepaid uh, or uh, a, a banking card and uh, pre uh, prefers to uh, pay in cash and then queue in a bank uh, to, or an automatic teller machine to get that cash out. Uh, it's, it's the same consumer that wants to stay uh, with what uh, she or he knows and, and, and feels more comfortable with. Yes. Um. Yeah, so um, my, I, mean, I think it was a very good point and I, I think there was a saying which goes that um, the light bulb was not really invented by the leading candle manufacturer. So there's always going to be resistance um, from incumbents. But I think what, th we, what we see in the UK is that a lot of the incumbents are already coming on board. And I think a lot of the challenges has to do with institutional and regulatory legacies um, because there's, whenever you introduce um, new services, there are always a high degree of unintended consequences. And regulators, they can deal with 
with, uh, they can deal with risks because you can quantify it and you can then mitigate it. But it's the uncertainty which where the challenge is. Now, um, my the, 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 some of the things that need to happen right now are is not necessarily what I'm reflecting government policy, rather than what I understand from the stakeholder communities that I work very closely with. But um, what marketplace needs, uh, what the, the regulatory uh, and the, the new marketplace need to take into into account is data accessibility and data governance. Um, so right now it's very difficult for new players to um, enter the market when they don't have any uh, visibility of where congestions are happening on the grid, uh, if they don't have any access to uh, consumer uh, consumption data. Um, there's a lot of data that isn't being collected. Uh, some of the data that is being collected is unharmonized. There is uh, no st lack of standardization. And, and then some part of the data is currently proprietary. So how do you unlock that? Um, another aspect is to basically align incentives. So you need to incentivize flexibility because right now there are situations where, for instance, energy intensive industries do not feel the incentive to even take part in flexibility markets because they are now benefiting from a certain tariff um, bracket, which engaging in flexibility will move them out of it and it can actually lead to up to seven figure losses, right? So that, that's, that's a very uh, important issue. And then the question is, um, are we looking at uh, different flexibility markets for different services, or are we looking at integrated market for very different services, whether it's balancing, um, balancing load, congestion management, or let's say uh, frequency response? And uh, I think this is where we really need to help um, these businesses because it's very difficult to um, create business case and for value stacking when they have to sign into different markets and, and then, you know, look, let alone the different balancing markets across different countries. I'd just like to go back to what Mr. Poulakis said about regulation prompting demand response. And it's exactly the case with IMO 2020. A new regulation is prompting ship owners to look at different alternatives. And I think that one of the best ways to overcome resistance is putting them in front of hard economic facts. And it's seeing that it's going to be more expensive to continue with their old ways um, than to move to cleaner alternatives, which can end up being cheaper. And even though we'd like to think everyone wants to move towards a cleaner future out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, that's simply not the case. But when the economic incentives make sense, that's when everyone will move in, um, in that direction. Any other comment on that point? So if you don't mind, I'll move to, the, yeah? Okay, yes, I had just another point I would like to cover and then uh, give the microphone to the floor. Well, it seems you, you, you have insisted on, well, all the new technologies that could be used to produce electricity, to store electricity, all the importance of digital technologies and so on. But it seems to me that there is one point. For all these models, you need a very sophisticated grid. And it seems that there is not much said about the grid. And don't you think that it will be a main problem? I mean, one major obstacle, at least something that we take time. If I, if I take the typical case of France, you know, the grid was designed for a highly centralized uh, power generation system. Well, moving to a grid that would fit for the type of solution you describe, you know, it's a huge effort to be made. And it will take time and a lot of money. So uh, what's your point of view on this? It's a good point. Um, so, but there are tools. I mean, this transition period will take time for sure um, to be able to have a fully functional smart grid economy. And uh, there are tools already in place to take you to, through this transition period. So, for example, G is, there is a resistance from a lot of people, you know, trying to digitalize, uh, to invest. But I think the whole economy and the, the, you know, the new era and the new generations are coming in are more, let's say, adaptive to that. So we see now the clients slowly transitioning. Also the mindset in uh, the necessity to move to more digital, more cloud. It will take time, but uh, I think that um, uh, we, we must not make the mistake we did 10 years ago because this transition period of the power market today is running so fast that we are only behind it sometimes. Even great companies like G, you know, 
underestimated the, the, how fast the market changes. So we need to be agile and you know, ready all the time. And we need to also to embrace what is coming up. Um, yes, you are quite right. The uh, grid should be smart in order to actually, um, if, we, if we need to implement and to introduce all these new technologies in order to become the, the, um, the power system to become more sustainable. Uh, and this is one of the issues that uh, we are discussing as regulators all the time. And uh, let me give you an example from Cyprus. Since uh, we are looking towards 2030 now, uh, we have already issued two regulatory decisions in Cyprus. The first one is the introduction of smart meters in every customer, and this will take around five years in order to replace all the uh, uh, metering with smart meters. And the second, we have issued a regulatory decision for the TSO and the DSO in order to proceed with the redesign of the, um, um, uh, of the power system, or of the grid, uh, in order to accept uh, distributed generation uh, as well as uh, generation at, um, uh, at the household level. Uh, so this would take time, but at least we have started in order to transform the grid into a smart grid. So again, passing from uh, the big systems to the local system, uh, this idea to unify the grid could be an opportunity. Why could be an opportunity? Because uh, let's imagine today how many different grids, we, grids between bracket, we have uh, in uh, uh, our cities. One for telecom, one for fiber, one for public lighting, one for power, one for electric recharge uh, for uh, immobility. No? If you want uh, to install a new uh, recharge station for immobility, you need uh, to ask for the permission to launch uh, a civil work that uh, in the United States uh, or France probably is quite feasible. If you go in Italy, in particular in some part of Italy, is a nightmare. It could take uh, three months, no? something about that. So if we leverage the uh, network of uh, the uh, public lighting that typically is the oldest and the, being the oldest is the wider in terms of dimension of the, um, I don't have the word in, uh, in English, the cabo where the cable uh, uh, pass, uh, the cables pass, uh, you can concentrate there, changing obviously the wires, you can concentrate then there lighting, recharging, fibers, uh, monitoring and so on with a simple extraordinary maintenance activity because changing a cable is not a new civil work but is a standard is a um, uh, extraordinary maintenance that means typically one tenth permission timing versus a new uh, work uh, work stream Question in the in, in the room. To, well, let's take my my microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mamdouh Salama, an international oil economist. Uh, my comment is directed to Dr. Andreas Polikakis. Uh, the hydrogen economy is non-starter. It's at the very bottom of the alternative energy sources, and we have Iceland to prove it. For the last 30 years, they have been trying to build a uh, hydrogen economy without much success. Vis-a-vis -vis transition to energy, those who are involved there should heed two major premises. One, there will never be a post-oil era during the 21st century and far beyond. Second, there will never be peak oil uh, demand 
And even with the electric vehicles, the contribution will be so small, it will never replace oil. So rather than build castles on the sand, we should take, to think realistically and talk about these two principles. Thank you. Who wants to answer it? Thank you very much for the comment. Uh, I totally agree with you. That's why I used two words. First of all, to stimulate the discussion. And the second was optimistic scenario. You are quite right. You said not in the 21st century. Maybe during the end of the 21st century. Maybe uh, during the starting of the 22nd century. But we are still at the research and development phase concerning the hydrogen economy. We are still at the uh, uh, research and development phase, not in the implementation. There are various initiatives, for example, the uh, fuel cell uh, and hydrogen initiative of the European Union. There are hydrogen filling stations, for example, around Europe, but we are still at the beginning. Thank you. Comment on that point? So, is there another question in the room? So, maybe I can use, we still have five minutes, so I will use my privilege of a moderator to ask a last question. Well, uh, there was not much said about uh, energy efficiency, by the way. And when you think of it, uh, most of the uh, CO2 emissions come from, uh, particularly when you have poor housing conditions. Well huge waste and it's if if i remember well i don't have the precise numbers in my, in my mind but this is the main source of the co2 emission and the main problem to be sorted out so do you have any solutions for that do you have any comment to make on this because that's that's where i, I would be a bit pessimistic we have solutions to produce electricity smarts a lot of progress can be done in this field but as long as housing is what it is today and we think of the cost of renovation uh, Many cases, you would have to put the building down and build a new one to, to, to really achieve efficiency. So uh, do you have anything to comment on this? I, I know it's totally uh, out of, of the topic we were supposed to cover this morning, but don't you think it's a major issue? In the UK, for instance, it's, it's a major issue, and I, I'm not sure that much progress has been done on this, e even though there are lots of surveys showing that it's a terrible point, which relates to uh, uh, fuel poverty and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, there's a very good point, and uh, I do apologize um, because the, sh the bre brevity of, of the presentation, I couldn't go into much of the data, but um, in context of some of the, so in, in terms of the low carbon economy in the UK, uh, it's basically in, uh, seeing enormous, um, about, uh, I believe, uh, 48 billion turnover, uh, pounds of turnover. Um, and what we see in, in, the, in the sector, in the low carbon sector, is that the the, the subsector of the low carbon economy that's growing the fastest and employing the most number of people is actually energy efficiency. So th that, that is certainly a sector that is um, thriving. Uh, very good observation. Just uh, uh, to make a point that will give you uh, the dimension, the huge dimension of the problem of energy efficiency. The average Greek household consumes more for heating, taking into consideration the good weather conditions of Greece, than the average Swedish household. So you see uh, the, the way forward, the way to improve efficiency has a huge potential. Thank you all for your very clear, straight to the point presentation and very valuable. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>